And now also I have the honor to introduce formally our new State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Mr. Mark Johnson, and of welcoming him here at the board table. Now let me tell you a bit about Mr. Johnson, and I certainly invite him to share more with us during his remarks. He hails from the great state of Louisiana. It's kind of hard for me to say that, but, <laughs> but I'm so proud to be a North Carolinian. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> Good. We, I, I hail from the great state of Maryland, in case you don't know. Really so we're sure. both imports. You're about to live now. Well, everybody thinks I hail from this state, so that's fine. As a child and young man, he was greatly influenced by his grandmother, Miss Irene Johnson, who dedicated her professional life to teaching. After high school, Mr. Johnson attended and graduated from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, where Mr. Hill and I graduated too, so we have that in common. Uh, he then began his career in Mecklenburg County Schools as a Teach for America teacher at West Charlotte High School, where he served for two years. Following that time as a teacher, Mr. Johnson attended law school at UNC Chapel Hill. He most recently served as a corporate counsel at an international technology company based in Winston-Salem. He also has recently served on the Winston-Salem Forsyth uh, County School Board and on, on November 8th was elected to become our newest state superintendent of public instruction. I note that uh, Superintendent Johnson and his wife have a preschool aged daughter um, and I ask you to join me in welcoming formally Mr. Mark Johnson. <laughs> Superintendent Johnson, I recognize you for your remarks. Thank you. I'll I'll take this opportunity, uh, instead of a superintendent's report this month, because uh, I've been on the job for, I think this is my third day, um, to repeat a story that many of you in this room have probably already heard, uh, many of you probably have not, many listening have probably not, and importantly, people in this department have probably not. I want to share with you why I'm here, why I'm passionate about education, and what my guiding principles will be over the course of the next few years. It goes back to starting with my grandfather. Uh, my grandfather grew up poor, dirt poor. My grandfather did not graduate from high school. Um, and he, he grew up in a time where it was easier to not graduate from high school and be able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps just through sheer hard work. And that's what he did. Uh, he was a salesman and he sold door to door across the southeast. As a result of his hard work, he changed the trajectory for my family. My family had every educational opportunity that we could want or need or desire. And as a result, I was fortunate enough to go to Emory University and then eventually on to UNC School of Law. And that's because my grandfather and my family instilled into me that the work you do in your K through 12 education years can truly determine what kind of work you do for the next 40 or 50 years after that time. And I took that to heart. But what they also instilled in me because of my grandfather's background is that not everyone in our country has that opportunity. Even today, in the year 2017, not every child has the opportunity to go to one of our schools, get a great education, work hard, and reach their American dream. And that made me angry. And I wanted to work hard to do something about it. So after college, I went and I taught at West Charlotte High School. West Charlotte High School is a very very difficult place to be a teacher, but it's an even harder place to be a student. I taught ninth grade science. The ninth graders in my class 
for true freshmen, 13 and 14 year olds, mixed in with 16, 17, and 18 year old ninth graders who just weren't passing the ninth grade. I had that range of students in my class. And I have great success stories that I carry with me. But what I also carry with me are the memories of the students who wouldn't eat breakfast unless they ate at West Charlotte that morning. The student who every day was dropped off by the bus at a motel where she lived that could change from one week to the other. The students who would turn to me and say, Mr. Johnson, what does it matter? I'll just be in jail in a few years anyway. And the story that I tell, that I carry with me, all through the campaigning across the state, all through the early mornings of school visits and the late nights of school board meetings, the story that drives me and that drove me here to this seat is that in my second year of teaching, my classroom management was much, much, much better. My students would walk in in the morning, they'd be silent, they'd pick up their reading exercise, they'd get a textbook, and they'd start their silent reading work. Now this was a phenomenal classroom management tactic because students would one, they'd come in calm, so you already are starting the class off on the right foot. Two, they'd be practicing reading. I was in a science class and my students were practicing reading. And three, they'd be reading to learn because they were reading the material that we were then gonna go over that day in class. One of my 16 year old ninth graders who was usually more interested in goofing off in class or skipping class came in one day and he saw all of the students engaged in this work and he quietly waved me over and he whispered Mr. Johnson can I get the reading assignment well I was through the roof with excitement this is a teacher's dream moment I had finally reached my hardest to reach student one of my 16 year old ninth graders that just was on track to drop out wanted to read the silent reading assignment with the 13 and 14 year old ninth graders but I contained my excitement so as not to blow his cover <laughs> I quietly got the reading assignment gave him a textbook and pretended like it was no big deal until five minutes later, he again quietly waved me over and with a horrible look of defeat in his eyes that I still remember to this day, he told me, Mr. Johnson, I can't read the words in this book. Now when I traveled across the state campaigning and going to chicken dinners in random counties, visiting schools, visiting teachers, visiting superintendents. When I had to spend nights away from home, when I spent early mornings away from my daughter and my wife, when I missed time with my daughter to be at school board meetings, that's the story I carried with me. Because the system had failed that young man. He was able to get to the ninth grade as a 16 year old, and he couldn't read probably just on a fifth grade level. And that's what has driven a great sense of urgency within me to transform our public education system so that I can see in my lifetime a school system that does not allow that to happen. And where every student who's willing to do the work will have the opportunity to get a great education and leave our schools prepared for either the workforce or for college. So just to give you what my guiding principles will be, and I hope you join with me over the next few years. My first guiding principle is urgency. This is urgent. Today is January 5th, 2017. There will never be another January 5th 2017 ever again 
no matter how we use this day, if we make the most of it or if we waste it, it's gone. Every day that we don't take bold actions for our students is a day that our students lose. Every day that we don't take bold actions for our teachers is a day that our teachers lose. Every year that goes by that we don't take bold actions for our students in our underperforming schools is a year lost for some of our students who can't afford to, you, to lose that year. Complacency is the antithesis of urgency. So I ask that we act with urgency and not be complacent in anything that we do. Because if we don't act with urgency, we will continue to betray students, and we will continue to lose teachers and have difficulty retaining them and recruiting them. We have to own that. And in fact, that leads us to my guiding principle number two, ownership. We have a lot of issues and challenges facing us. We have to own them. Yesterday, what struck me when we watched the video of teachers reviewing standards, one teacher turned to another and said, this is just confusing. We have to own that. We have to own that we need to do something about testing. We have to own that there are students graduating from our schools that we are giving diplomas to who are not prepared for college or the workforce. We are the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. It is our job to own those challenges and to find solutions. We must be innovative to find solutions. So that leads to my guiding principle number three, innovation. Innovation will lead to the true transformation of public education. And we've already spent time in this room together talking about some of the great things innovation can do. Just yesterday, we talked about the innovative tools that can make life easier for teachers and make students want to own their own learning. Our current system is outdated. I will be generous and I will say that this system was designed for students in the 1950s. And I say that as generous because you could probably trace this system that we're using today back to the 1920s, or even earlier. Students of 1917, or 1937, or 1947, or 1957, or 1977, or 2007, needed a different level of preparation than students now in 2017 are going to need. So we will need to be innovative. Innovation will be the key to transforming public education. And I believe that if we work together with urgency, with ownership, and with innovation, we can start at the dawn of a new era in public education. Because this is the United States of America. No matter who you are, no matter your neighborhood, no matter your background, you should be able to go to school, work hard, and reach your American dream. Not only is that for the benefit of society, not only are the words behind me our obligation in our state constitution, but it's just the right thing to do by our own moral obligation. This is North Carolina, where the weak grow strong and the strong grow great. I'm excited to announce officially that my first step as state superintendent will be to embark on a listening tour across the state of North Carolina. And I will spend the rest of this school year doing just that listening, listening to key stakeholders, east, west, north, south, urban, rural, mountain, 
or beach. I will be traveling the state, listening to superintendents, school board members, teachers, parents, students, the business community, local lawmakers, lawmakers right across the mall in the state capitol, and people right here in this building. I'll be asking, what is it that we need to do better to support you in your mission to provide that opportunity to students? We will take good notes, and we will come back after the end of the school year and report those to you. And I hope to work together with you, with those guiding principles and that feedback, to present a vision of action items that we can go forward with for the next few years. So thank you very much. I look very, very much forward to working with this team to making sure that all students have that opportunity. Thank you. Well said, uh, Superintendent Johnson, and uh, I, I certainly join you in uh, <coughs> supporting uh, your vision and uh, those guiding principles. Uh, I have felt a sense of urgency ever since I started sitting in this chair. And the way I can help you with the tools that we have and what we know today, I don't think there are any excuses for us not reaching the low achievers and bringing them along so that they can experience the American dream and have a great life and we will all benefit. Not just them, we will all benefit. So uh, let's get on with the task. Uh, it's important. It's extremely important.